And sticking with politics, we do want to bring in Andy Kroll, who's the Washington bureau chief at Rolling Stone. Uh, Andy, thank you for getting up early with us uh, after a late night. What were your big takeaways from night three of the RNC? Well, Jill, I would you know, second what Karen had just said about the effort to really try to sand off the rough edges of this president. You heard it from Kellyanne Conway, obviously one of the president's longest serving advisors in the White House, who is now on her way out the door. You heard it from Kayleigh McEnany, the White House press secretary, trying to give a picture of Donald Trump, a, a, you know, a private portrait of him, you know, ex trying to say what he's like behind the scenes, what you see off camera. And that, that to me really came across as trying to get these voters in the president's camp to look past, you know, the tweets, to look past the incendiary comments in public and to try to make the, him feel, you know, more personal to these voters. The other thing I would, that really stuck out to me as well was this, the way that Vice President Pence and some of the other speakers kind of talked about how the Biden-Harris ticket would cause all these problems, would be such a threat to the nation at the same time that we are dealing with real threats in the nation, whether it's pandemic, whether it's an economic crisis, whether it is obviously unrest, uh, racial unrest all around the country. The, you know, v Vice President Pence, for instance, sort of talks about this as if this is something that could happen if you elect these people when it is actually happening right now across the country. So there was a weird sort of detachment, a weird disconnect between what we saw there on those podiums with the speakers last night and the previous two nights and what's actually happening around the country right now. I, and it, it feels like there's perhaps a disconnect as well when it comes to coronavirus, right? Um, the, the portrayal in this last week has been of a really effective response. And yet the U.S., of course, leads the world when it comes to cases and, and also deaths. So is that a strategy that can work? Because, of course, People live in reality, but I don't know. I mean, it, can this be effective? Polls have showed that this thing is getting a lot tighter. You're absolutely right, Jill, about the portrayal of the coronavirus crisis throughout this Republican convention. I mean, you see it in a visual sense, whether it was First Lady Melania Trump's speech last night at the White House or Vice President Pence's at Fort McHenry uh, last night and, and the First Lady two nights ago, pardon me. You know, there, people were not wearing masks in the crowd there was a sort of discussion of this virus as if it were finished, this pandemic as if it were over, um, as if it were mission accomplished. I mean, Vice President Pence was even fist bumping people in the crowd last night. That obviously is not part of the CDC guidelines for containing and, and, and getting rid of this virus. And so I think what what's going on is, a, is an attempt by the administration to kind of move past the virus, even though the virus is not done with us. You, you saw it even a couple of nights ago with economic advisor Larry Kudlow referring to the virus in the past tense, saying it was awful. Obviously, it is awful right now. This is ongoing. So I think that is part of this strategy. I really do think, though, that the uh, Trump-Pence ticket is really just trying to get Americans to look past this, to move the attention over to the supposed threat posed by radicals Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I mean, really, what you heard last night about uh, Vice President Biden and Senator Harris, you know, you, you could have, that could have been Bernie Sanders. I mean, it, it, it seems like the strategy that the Trump campaign is using, the language they're using, how extreme Biden and Harris could be, you could have put any Democrat in there because it is just a strategy to cast Democrats as extremists and Republicans as the party that will preserve, I guess, some form of this country that their voters think they want. So I, I think the coronavirus strategy is really telling here. Uh, what are you expecting out of tonight? Of course, it's the, it's the culmination of the convention. What are you expecting to hear from President Trump? I think you'll hear a summation, Jill, of all the things we've heard in the three nights leading up to tonight. I mean, really, the 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 what's come through in this convention is the Republican strategy going into the next seventy days or so of this campaign. It is that the Republican Party is the party of law and order. It is the party that will keep you safe. It is the party that will, I guess, lead you through the coronavirus pandemic. Though obviously the facts on the ground belie that. And then you're going to hear that the Biden-Harris ticket is radical. It's extreme. 
they are the party of the Democrats are the party of, you know, the Green New Deal, radical socialism, et cetera, et cetera. And we, me being President Trump here, you know, we're the party that's going to keep you safe. I think you're going to see the president sort of put his voice behind that message that we've heard sort of reinforced over the last couple of nights. Obviously, there'll probably be some improv along the way, like there always is. But the message from the Trump campaign is clear, as we've heard these last three nights. And I think you'll see the president, you know, really put try to put a fine point on that tonight. Um, and, and I want to look even even past the convention. Uh, just a few weeks left until the election. And, and it's basically going to be back to the Democrats now to try and uh, explain what they do stand for. Um, what is their strategy uh, post Republican convention? Well, I think we got the clearest preview of this last week in their convention, Jill. And it's a really stark contrast from what we're hearing this week, the Republican convention. You know, the Democratic convention really seemed to set up this image of, of a big tent party. And you had everyone from Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez speak to a former Republican governor of Ohio and Republican candidate for president, John Kasich. Vice President Biden obviously cast the decision as one between darkness and light, hope and fear. But I really think the Democrats are putting forward a sort of big tent, you know, pull in moderate voters, pull in independent voters, suburban women, um, all of those kind of classic independent voters that they think they can win over and, and, and then obviously defeat Trump in November. And so that's their strategy. And then the Republican strategy is very much one about motivating their base, motivating those loyal voters who are maybe on the fence or who maybe feel a little bit burned by the last couple of years, getting them energized about President Trump again. And so I, I see this sort of big tent versus base strategy playing out. And I think you're going to see that from the Democrats now and really until Election Day, trying to you know, find those moderate voters in the key state battleground states around the country, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Florida, and try to bring them into the Biden-Harris camp with this message of, you know, we are the party, we, we are the sane party, the big tent party. These other guys, you know, have run the country into the ground for the last four years, come over to our side. You know, whether that's a winning strategy, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's a base strategy versus a, a, a sort of big tent strategy. It's going to be fascinating to watch the next couple of weeks how this starts to play out, Jill. And we will uh, very much be looking forward to all of your reporting. Um, Andy Kroll, Washington Bureau Chief over at Rolling Stone. So great to have you on this morning. Really appreciate it.